Amen. Who makes the coffee? He do. Hebrews. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hallelujah. Love Hebrews. Love the book. Amen. Such a good book. Tonight, I just want to throw this at you since all of you, you may get to say this. I'm sure if you're uh, considering watching the game at all, you're going to DVR it like I am. And, uh, but every now and then when, when the Astros hit a home run, I, I'd yell, whoop, there it is. Amen. I got to say something. You know, I'm not quiet about it. It's uh, either a touchdown Alabama or whoop, there it is. And uh, so here it is. I'm going to tell you about whoop, there it is, when peace found you. Amen. And the issue in life is that peace finds us whenever we find our place in life. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 says, By faith, Abraham. Now, remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If you've seen it, if you touched it, it's not faith. It's reality. But before that it becomes reality, it has to be faith. Same way with your healing. So the Scripture teaches us over and over again, uh, that's a real small overhead, but they're going to get it. I know they will. They're working on it back there. So don't worry about it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse, I'll start in verse 8. So if you got your Bible or your pad or phone, you can look at it right there. Hebrews 11, verse 8, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, that's the most powerful scripture to me, to go somewhere where you don't know. How many of we got to know where we're going? I got a, a funeral tomorrow at 2 o'clock at uh, cross town, and I need to know where I'm going. And uh, sometimes folk would tell me that, and they won't give me enough info. And I, today I said, hey, where am I going? Because I want to know where I'm going. And if I don't, I can't get there. But Abraham, by faith, was going somewhere where he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents and did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. So you remember the children of Israel ended up in the promised land after they left Egypt after 400 years. What you need to know is it was already their land because Abraham had already been there. And his sons had been there and his grandsons had been there. So he, it was already established. So again, you have to imagine where would you be without direction? And no matter where the ultimate de destination might be, the ability to de determine the course is the most essential element needed for achieving the goal. The biggest thing to remember is when you're on a journey is to enjoy it. you got to enjoy it. And I've learned this, this secret many years ago in pastoring and not only that in traveling. Enjoy the journey. Amen. Because there is, the destination for us, of course, is heaven. That's where we're going. But until we get there, let's enjoy the journey. I'll be making a trip to Alabama here in a few weeks, H, and I'm going to enjoy the journey. Amen. All the way there. I'm going to just think about the trip and look around and take a little bit more time. Sister Lori and some girls took a trip a while back, and she listed, listed a whole bunch of places where she was going. I knew where she was going to be pretty much every night. Amen. I, it was documented. She left that piece of paper accidentally, so then I knew where she was. Amen. So it's only when we have a definite course and we combine direction with movement that we can obtain progress. Now, again, faith is intangible. It can't be articulated. I can't tell you how much faith you got. I've been around people uh, Sunday morning in the house. I felt faith arise. There are times I know faith is in the building. You know, you just you sense it there. It's, it's, it's all the way around it. And you know when you don't have it, that you start sinking down. Your, your countenance will change. But people with faith believe God for the impossible. Amen. They have that ability. And it can't be explained. But through Scripture, Hebrews 11, 1 again says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now Abraham, I've always called, you know, his name was Abe until he got his children. Then they changed, God changed his name to Abraham. Abe means daddy. Abraham means big daddy. Amen. So even before he got children, he was named Daddy. He was already had that name attached to him, but then he became Big Daddy. I understand a little bit of that Big Daddy stuff because uh, I didn't have kids, and all of a sudden I got kids, and then your kids, sometimes that like, well, anyway. It demonstrates his faith heading to a place that he has not seen and cannot describe. Genesis 22, 1 says, Sometime later God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, I reply, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So again, first he traveled into a place that he didn't know of, and now God's going to test him and tell him to go to a mountain that he's never been to. It seemed like Abraham's whole life had to do with 
uh, having to totally live by, because you tell me, where is mountain I know not? Where is mountain I know not? I don't know that mountain. I've never, but I'm going to tell you. So the issue is taking those steps in life. And as you begin to take steps in life, and here's what happens. Uh, we're going to get to the definition here of more of peace in a minute. But some people think peace is just a removal of a whole bunch of problems. That ain't never going to happen in your life. Amen. Your peace in life is going to happen when you've got all those problems and dealing with your children and issues and all the things in life. That's when the real peace comes in. So, again, faith, I'm not real sure what I'm looking for, but I'll know when I get there. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this thought, but he did take his son. He did pull back the knife. He did start to sacrifice him. And then there was a ram caught in the bushes. I've often thought to myself, that ram was coming up the one side of that mountain you know not of, while here the man... Uh, Abraham and his son Isaac was coming up the other side of the mountain. That God had this thing. His timing is impeccable. It's amazing. The angel held his hand back and said, whoa, don't do it. I just want to see. And I've often felt like God was going, he knew in the next 2,000 years that he would be actually more 1,000 years than that, about 3,000 years later, that he's going to be sacrificing his own son. And is there anybody else on this earth that thinks like me and acts like me? And at that moment, Abraham became the friend of God. Amen. He, was, he wasn't just his son. He was a friend of God. Amen. He was connected to him because of his faith. And let me say this. God will never, ever ask any of us to sacrifice our children again. Amen. He did a sacrifice once and for all. He's never going to sacrifice your children. He's never going to ask you to throw your children on the, on the altar of sacrifice. God ain't going to do that. In other words, I've seen people use this scripture as a morbid way of saying, okay, I want to show God how much I love him. I'm going to sacrifice. Yeah, that ain't the sacrifice. God's looking for obedience obedience is more, God rather have obedience than sacrifice. Some people will give a sacrifice. You know, they'll give, and they, they feel like, okay, I gave a sacrifice once a year, twice a year. I did something extraordinary for God. That's good enough. God would rather have you 724 being obedient to him than one great big sacrifice. I mean, a lot of people do a big sacrifice. They want to uh, advertise it. But your faithfulness has been advertised in the halls of heaven. Amen. God knows what you're doing and, what, and how you're doing it. So now that's faith. It, it's that thing, that place, that indescribable something that we pursue without fully being able to fully explain to others the unique drive we have toward it. It's that yes moment. It's that, yeah, I, we, we're there. We got it. Amen. It's, it's, it's a good thing. It, there, there's a place in our soul that informs us inwardly when it's the right place, the person, the thing, or whatever we pursue. It's that yes moment. And I can't, you know, yours may be different than mine, but I know when yes is there. I know when we're doing the right thing. You know, we talked about, like, it just as simple as yesterday was. We talked about doing it and, and doing that ride. Uh, I wasn't going to do it. And then I just I felt like, man, let's do this thing. And when it was over, it was the biggest yes moment. It was like, this was so much good. And I got so many re good responses from people that had so much more fun than just getting candy. They made a memory. Amen. There was something about the memory. The one thing I did learn is never let kids ride it twice. Learn that lesson good. Because here's what happens if you let kids ride it twice. They sit right there and they act like you. Have you ever been with somebody that's seen the movie before you and they're telling you about the movie? Amen. All the way through it, Megan, they tell you about the movie. And, and, and even before the park gets there, they, they say, you know, watch this. Watch this. This is how you fix the pull gun. Shoot down. Yeah, yeah. That's what was going on. And I learned real quick, I ain't never taking them twice again. Amen. They were sharing the movie for it. Okay, here comes a guy. He's going to come out of the woods with a chainsaw. Shut, I, I said, shut up. <laughs> Amen. In the back there. So, so here he goes. He, it's that whoop, there it is moment. Genesis 22, 4. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. He saw the mountain. He knew it. He had that inside of him. He looked. He was expecting. He saw the place. And there is nothing more explosive than the moment we look up and we see something that makes chimes ring, bells toll inside of us. When faith tells us, this is the place. This was the moment. This, this is what we're here for. It is faith that guides us. Divine guidance. You know, I believe in divine appointments. Meeting people on the road, connecting with them. Uh, you know, you'll stop at a gas station and run across somebody you ain't seen in a long time. You make friends with somebody. You reconnect with them. That, those divine, I love that, but I also love divine guidance. It enables you to know that you are on the right track doing what you're supposed to be doing. When you move to a new place, geography can cause stress. Man, when you go into a place you've never been before, uh, even coming to a church, how many know that going to a church you've never been before, walking into it, can cause stress? some anxiety. You don't know what's going to happen in there. 
And because there's all kind of places out there in different churches. And that's why we being inviting here is such a powerful force to people who come here. When they see you integrating and talking and, and cutting up just a little bit for church, that's a good thing. You're not spitting icicles. You're not being mean toward one another. Hey Amen. That's a good one. In the foyer, you got somebody opening the door. Sometimes when it gets uh, a whole lot of folk coming, we got folk parking and greeting. Amen. That, that's an important thing. So peace versus stress. I hear this word more than I should, and I think it's because, again, we have opportunity on social media to complain. But people talk about being in stress a lot, and, and the doctors talk about it being the thing that hurts your heart with too much stress. Why you need to find your place in this life? When you find your place, again, let me say it eliminates competition. When you find your place, it eliminates stress out of your life. Stress is the result of doing something outside of your place. When you take a new job, it always starts a little, with a little bit of stress unless you absolutely know what you're doing. But when you take that new job and you get knowing what's going on and it, all of a sudden now stress is alleviated because you know what you're doing. You're connected. You've, you're understood. You know what's going on. So now when stress leaves, guess what comes in? Peace finds you. Amen. It moves in its place. So stress is pressure placed on your body emotionally, intellectually, physically, and psychologically. Now, what happens with that, when it happens, you'll want to, it's called flight syndrome. You want to fly. You want to get away from it. You feel that pressure, and you want to, you want to move from it. It's like dealing with horses. So you, you want to stay back from it. The thing in life is I, I have found that when I, particularly the little country church when we started it, I decided I wanted to live as stress-free as I could. Now, somebody said, how do you live stress-free? What we've gone through in 19 years. I didn't let a lot of things bother me. Amen. I let the little things be the little things. I learned how to uh, negotiate certain things. I learned how to put priority on the main thing. What's the main thing? So I'm going to put priority on that. There's always going to be incidentals. A lot of times somebody will call me and tell me about somebody in the hospital. Well, okay. Uh, and they say, Pastor, you ready to go see them? How close to death are they? That's a hard question. Well, you don't know. I don't know either. But I've, I found out that to a certain degree said that if I ran to every hospital and every visit, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be all my time, and, and, and it, it puts a stress level on you. But let me flip this script just a little bit. One time I missed a hospital visit, and somebody I love passed, and I've never got over it. So it does put this angst on me to make sure, you know, because I, 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 if you flip through my phone, H, you would see me standing by the bed of people all through that phone. And most of them, I've done their funerals right after that. It was one of the last pictures they made. Maybe their family didn't even know it, but I took pictures with them. Amen. Because I wanted to remember them. And I wanted, to know to them, I wanted them to know before they left, you're important to me. Amen. You mean something to me. I love you like that. So, I, and I pray that passes on with Pastor David and Pastor Joseph, anybody else in this building that visits, you know. Josiah visits, folks. It, it's important for us to get out and visit. Can you get an amen? Now, look, if I'm in the hospital and I catch you taking a picture with me, I might get a little nervous. Maybe y'all know something other folk may not know about that. So adrenaline, adrenaline, this, we got, everybody here got adrenaline. It, it starts running out as you get older. But you, you got adrenaline in you. And it has to be produced to deal with stress. And, and when you get out of place, when you get a job you're not made for, a work you don't enjoy, it's often, what happens is a premature death. You'll read now where people passing very young. You wonder what happened prematurely. Stress hit them, and the next thing you know, uh, the, the stress is gone. What did you say in HD? It is. I had a black beard. You say, you talking about the black beard? You talking about being skinny? The teeth, the teeth are the same teeth I got right now. Is he good? Is he a good guy? I don't know anything about Jimmy. Oh, Diamond. Oh, my God. I love Diamond Jim. Roberts. Jimmy Roberts. Yeah, yeah, I remember him well. Yes, sir. She's probably watching right down here in you. All right. The opposite of stress, again, is peace. And Jesus being the prince of peace, it means he's not the prince of stress. Amen. So it's important to realize if you stress all the time, you need to get a bigger Jesus. You, you got to grow just a little bit more. Peace is God's original plan. I've often said peace is just in one's life to the will of God. 
So what's the will of God for your life? Adjust your life to it. Amen. Find out what that is. It, it has two distinct definitions. First definition comes out of the Webster Dictionary. It says freedom from war, civil strife, public disturbance. Do you realize this is never going to happen in our lifetime? We will never know this kind of peace that, that results from, from being in, in this place, a, a war, civil strife, public disturbance. But an undisturbed state of mind is the second definition. Uh, rest from worry and fear, serenity. That can't happen in our lifetime. Amen. That's what we can go through. It's almost as if Webster actually defined the world's definition. And then he said, let me tell you what God's definition is. And by the way, how many noticed that the uh, definitions are changing? I like going back to the old definitions, you know. I don't like this new stuff that's popping out because it's twisted words and it's made things sound like that. that's not exactly what they were meant to sound like. Some bad news is, as for the rest, it's never going to get better. In this life, there's never going to be peace, that we're going to have wars, we're going to have rumors of wars, amen, there'll be battles are going to be ongoing, people are never going to stop killing each other, earthquakes, you can outlaw guns and somebody will use a hammer. Earthquakes, famines, viruses, natural disasters, never going to go away. Hospitals are never going to stop denying entrance. Cemeteries are never going to be closed their gates and say, we can't have no more in here. So, some more bad news. There's never going to be an end to troubles and trials of life. No matter your social, political, religious, or ethnic background, what happens in the middle of, no of November, amen, you're going to have troubles in this life. There will always be struggles financially. You're going to have it physically, emotionally, spiritually. And so if you're looking for a life without problems, you're in the wrong life. And I'm sorry, this is the only one you're going to get. Everybody has a problem. Everybody is a problem. Everybody lives with a problem. Don't look around. You know what I'm saying. Amen? So when I walk through Scripture and I realize that this is going to happen, but I can have peace in the midst of the trouble and all the things that are going on. And this is the kind of peace that Abraham had to have to go look for a country that was not his, to, to literally take and sacrifice his son, amen, and God stay his hand and show him that, that he had to peace. You know, this is what Abraham said. According to the New Testament, if I remember this correctly, Abraham believed that even if he killed his son, God would have raised him from the dead. Amen. He understood God that much. You got to be a friend of God. You got to be close to God to understand the heart of God and to know exactly who he is like that. So in spite of all, there's this peace that God gives. It's not predicated on what's going on. And this is what you got to get through your head. It, it doesn't matter what's happening around us. I can still have the peace of God. In the midst of, that's why the scripture calls it peace that passes all understanding. Amen. When I dug a little deeper into this word, and I'm going to close with this right now, John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I challenge you to look up the death of the apostles and what they went through in life and the troubles they had. Their troubles were immense. Their opportunity for being, when again, this, the beatings of Paul the Apostle, John being, had oil poured on him and banished to an island that he had never been to. He was incarcerated there. Thomas was ran through with a spear in northern Africa, Doubton Thomas. These men had tremendous faith, but before they left, Jesus spoke to them. He said, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world, and you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome this world. Amen. I remind myself so much that this world is not my home. Uh, you know, my, my, I woke up this morning, and uh, I felt like I'd been thrown off a horse. I was sore. I was struggling to, to get moving, looking for sympathy. I found none. My wife said the same thing. She was thrown from the same horse. I look at my dog, and she looks up at me, and there's the sympathy. Amen. Very little comfort, but sympathy. Hallelujah. You know, and that, that's life as you get older. It, it just happens. But one thing I understand is we move through this life and these bodies deteriorate and wear out. This is not our home. It's not where we belong. But Jesus overcame this world. He came, overcame it so much that even after his beaten body was wrapped with 75 pounds of aloe and myrrh and 75 pounds. They wrapped Jesus, 75 pounds worth of stuff put him inside a tomb in three days they knew he was dead dead joseph of arimathea and nicodemus they knew he was dead 
And three days later, he rose. So he said, let me tell you, I've overcome this world. I've beat it every way you can beat it. I beat the devil every way I can beat him. I've, I've cured diseases. I've raised the dead. And I myself came up from the grave. So I don't want you worried. So when those men went out, they went out with confidence. They went out knowing that whatever happened to them, that God had them. And this is not the end of anything here. Psalm 119 says in verse 165. Again, Psalm 119 is the biggest chapter in the Bible. Amen. And it has many, many verses. So 165 says this. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I misspelled the word there, but it's okay. Walk kick. Amen. They that walk kick love thy law. It'll be, it won't be there tomorrow night. It'll be fixed. And nothing shall offend them. Isn't it amazing how people get offended? How quickly they get offended? Over little things. Especially today with this woke generation we're hearing about. Amen. So offended. But if you love God and you love his law, nothing shall offend you. It just, it just you got to remind yourself, I ain't going to be offended with that. I ain't going to let that bother me. And let me tell you something, Christians. Many of us, we get offended with what we see. If you get offended by what you see, quit looking at it. Well, you get offended by what you hear, quit listening to it. Amen. Quit putting yourself in places to always be offended. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen. Just do it. Just do the right thing. So, so we, I, I'm just tired of seeing people offended. Great peace, the they that love your law, and nothing will. Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. My heart, my emotional seat, my mind, my intellect, he's going to keep me. The Greek word denotes a peace so superior that it is held high above all other types of peace. This is a peace that transcends, outdoes, surpasses, excels, rises above, goes beyond and over the top of any other kind of peace. The implication is that people may try to find peace in other places, but there is no peace like the peace of God. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? There is no peace like the peace of God. So listen, the truth of the matter is this. If you don't have that peace, you need to get back with God again. Talk with him. You know, I, I live under an umbrella of peace like that. I fought for it. I fight for peace. Amen. I look for it. I hang out with people of peace. Don't hang out with troubled folk all the time if they're always troubled. Learn to put an ARC on your phone. Amen. Know who to answer, who not to answer. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for your people. As we leave here tonight, it passes all understanding. We thank you for the peace of God. Love, joy, peace. You give us those gifts. Lord, help us to love one another. Help joy show up when happy left. Let joy stay in us. And God, remind us that we live in the peace. We're just going to keep looking for that place till peace finds us. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. amen. God